Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Professor Nancy Fulbray, a director at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Nancy, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, pleasure. I'd like to speak to you. You've written about a number of areas, but I'd like to speak to you in particular about the economics of care, uh, which has been a, a major uh, subject area for you. You have spoken about this in regard to how it has um, gravitated from the family towards the, uh, the, the, the private market, uh, uh, providing a lot of the traditional care services that we associate with the family. Um, how well has uh, private sector provision uh, gone in this regard, and with this evolution? Well, first, think a little bit about what, what we mean when we talk about care, because uh, it's a pretty big word, and I think people use it to mean a, a lot of different things. But I guess I use it to mean work where concern for the well-being of the person that's receiving the services really matters. So the family is kind of the prototype for care work that's motivated by concern for others, and a, a tremendous amount of work gets performed in the family on that basis. But it's also true that a lot of people that are paid to provide care are, are genuinely involved with and attached to the people they're taking care of. And that's one of the reasons that uh, some substitution between families and markets is probably a good thing. Uh, the bad things happen, I think, when the way in which market care is provided disrupts that uh, caring relationship or makes it difficult for workers to do, to provide well, it, the care they well, like to provide. Well, it actually reduces it to an economic nexus, which in itself I would think is problematic. Well, I don't know. I think, be careful because I think uh, Julie Nelson and other feminist economists have talked a little bit about how the market and the money nexus is not quite as simple as people think it is. That you can actually have a market exchange that also has some emotional content. I'm a teacher. I care about my students. The fact that I'm paid to be a teacher, I don't think that necessarily undermines the quality of the of the work that I do. So just paying somebody for a service I don't think necessarily taints it or pollutes it in some way, but it does create an institutional framework uh, that can backfire, uh, like paying a teacher to increase students' test scores instead of to really increase the capabilities of students. That's an example of using a market incentive that I, I can't I think does can and does really undermine the caring relationship. Or paying a doctor for the, you know, number of patients he or she sees in a day. Yes, that kind of market logic can undermine it. But I think what's interesting and important about care work is that it's it's a very strong and persistent um, aspect of economic life, and it can and does often survive in a market within a market nexus. Uh, but it has to be an institutional nexus. And you need the right kind of policy framework yes. as well. Right. Yeah, and that's in, right. And in that regard, how, how well do you think we do here in the United States? Well, not so good, I think, in terms of the organization of health and education and social services, or in terms of the interface between family work and market work, which is another aspect of the care economy. It's making it possible for people to combine uh, market work that allows them to earn a decent living uh, with family care. Where, where are the shortcomings? Well, um, one big shortcoming is lack of paid family leave uh, mm -hmm. from work. Another shortcoming is lack of uh, control over uh, work hours. Another shortcoming is lack of early childhood education that could make it easier for parents to combine care of young children with, uh, with paid work. But you know the list goes on. You know the do, healthcare do system, the education system. Do uh, any countries do this well? It's generally said, for example, the Scandinavian countries generally tend to do yeah, much better. Yeah, I think in general, North countries in Northwestern Europe uh, do tend to do it better, both in terms of family policy and also in terms of wages and working conditions for paid workers in in care services. Whether it's that's uh, you know early childhood education teachers in uh, Scandinavia and France earn a much higher salary relative to other workers home care workers, better wages and working conditions, so, yeah. Now, you've, you've, you've not only talked about the policy aspects of it, but you've also, uh, your specific contribution to this has often been in the way we measure this. Uh, as specifically. Well, I am very interested in the value of unpaid work and how it affects economic living standards. And uh, we now have a lot of data about how people use their time, um, not just in the US, but in Europe and a lot of developing countries. And that data allows us to uh, measure pretty carefully how much time is spent caring for children, caring for elderly, doing housework, uh, doing shopping, activities like that. And uh, it's, it's quite relevant to understanding 
living standards. And it's also really relevant to understanding why uh, women are disadvantaged in the labor market relative to men, because they take on a bigger burden. The issue of how you quantify or measure this brings to mind the question that bedeviled economists in the 1990s when they tried to uh, uh, diff impu impute different measures of productivity by what's called the hedonic deflator. So, and, and one of the analogies that um, is often used is um, how did the aspirin uh, contribute towards in enhancing productivity by mitigating headaches or the introduction of air conditioning um, to uh, in in enhance productivity in, in, in the South. Uh, do, do you think that that particular measurement has any relevance to the type of work that you're doing? I think it's relevant to all forms of work, but back up a little bit, because it's okay. this, actually there's a much simpler way of thinking about the value of non-market work, which is just a counterfactual. If you were not at home taking care of your child, what would it cost you to hire somebody to do it? Now, the hedonic issue comes in in that those two things are not perfect substitutes, right? Especially you, if you get to the position where you've talked about where you're in not being paid a sufficient amount, even right now, in the, in the care professions in many instances. Right, but, those, but here's another way to think about it. Those hedonic issues affect every measurement of price right. and income. And what I'm really talking about is kind of a, a simpler and um, in some ways easier to remedy problem, which is that we just totally ignore the value of non-market work and looking at living standards which I think is just wrong, okay, so. And a huge contributor to gender inequality. Well, I think a, a, a reluctance to, to see non-market work as something that has tangible economic dimension, Fine. you know, yeah. that it can be measured and that, that one can ask what it would cost to replace it. I, I do think it's, it's really important. So I'll give you an example mm -hmm. that I think, for mm -hmm. me as an economist, is really telling. Let's say you have two families and they are demographically identical, two adults, healthy adults, and two children under the age of five, and both families have a market income of $50,000. We generally treat those families as though they have an identical standard of living. That's a u ubiquitous convention, mm -hmm. um, not just in the US but elsewhere. But imagine that one family has one full-time wage earner earning $50,000 and one full-time caregiver that's providing childcare, doing shopping, preparing meals, basically organizing the home. And the other family involves two wage earners each earning $25,000. Not in your wildest dreams would you ever suggest that those families have identical or even similar living standards, right? Because if you have two working parents, you have to purchase substitutes mm -hmm. for what that full-time caregiver is providing whether that's childcare or uh, meals away from home or uh, house cleaning services or whatever. And yet we continue to assume that market income itself is a sufficient indicator. It's interesting because it, it is a flaw, as you say, in the economics profession because, for yeah. example, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in law, you know, say a couple's going through a divorce, it's precisely that sort of value that is imputed as a form of, of, of establishing a, a, an alimony benchmark, for example. Well, it, although it doesn't really come into play very much in uh, alimony, and the legal treatment of unpaid work is also pretty uh, controversial. Uh, the idea that, for instance, that a wife has a, a legal right to part of her husband's earnings while she's still married to him is basically alien to our legal system. So it comes into play in the division of property after divorce, but the, the notion that a wife should have a legal claim on her husband's earnings um, is still highly contested in a lot of states. And that's because uh, courts were reluctant to see marriage as an economic transaction. Right. And, and so um, is economics the right discipline to look at the sorts of things you're doing or, or to establish a, a policy or... or a, a, well, a, I think it is. A lot of economists, and I think you, are suspicious of, of the idea... Not suspicious. I'm, I'm, I'm playing uh, dead ...or reluctant or, or nervous or something about, about the idea. And I think this is because we, we worry that the logic of the market inevitably contaminates the logic of, of the family. Right. And I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to divide things up a little bit differently instead of here's the family and it's all about love and altruism and here's the market and it's all about self-interest and um, competition. To see that families have elements of self-interest and conflict and negotiation in them and, and markets do too and in families and in markets we have care work that has some distinctive characteristics and some distinctive requirements and whether women are providing care at home or in the market, it tends to be under-rewarded and underappreciated. And that's, it's not something you can explain by reference to that market family division. I think care work really needs its own separate rubric. It's a distinctive 
form of work with distinctive implications. And to be clear, I, I, uh, I, I guess it was not so much that I, uh, the skepticism, of, I, I guess the, the narrow way in which we usually view economics is, is where I think you have the problems. But I think it's important for economics to broaden its boundaries precisely for the reasons that you've uh, described. Because I think within a traditional narrow a neoclassical nexus. You don't get a, a proper measurement or a proper way to gauge these issues. Right. No, that's right. But I think what's interesting about the feminist project, which is really where a lot of this effort to look at care work comes from, is that it's also been, it's, it's found, um, a, met a lot of resistance from neoclassical economics in the profession, but it's also met a lot of resistance from the traditional left uh, because it's calling attention to some dynamics that are not really part of capitalism per se as a system, but are, are somehow independent of or separate from a, a critical analysis of that thing that, that we call capitalism. And that, I, I think that's what makes feminist economics kind of conceptually interesting is this mm -hmm. tension between the, the two different points of, uh, of resistance to thinking about care work. So within that uh, uh, paradigm, as a feminist economist, uh, I don't like to throw around labels lightly, what would be the right, uh, uh, how would you read to, uh, think or reteach economics so as to, um, you know, solve this problem. Well, I guess I think, um, in some ways, I would invoke some vocabulary from both Marxian economics and neoclassical economics. I would say that um, people who um, provide care for others, especially dependents, find themselves in a very weak bargaining position mm -hmm. uh, because. Bargaining is about being able to withdraw your services if you're not getting what you think you deserve. But the very process of caring about somebody and feeling attached to them uh, uh, basically precludes that kind of bargaining logic. So uh, to become a care provider is in some ways to become vulnerable, whether you're doing it in the, in the family uh, or, or in the market, there's a, a kind of vulnerability there. That means you have to have some social norms and some institutional protections for caregivers. Unionization? And, and, and unionization is one. That's certainly part of it. Um, and uh, work family policies that, that recognize the value of family work uh, is another one. I think the whole list of policies that we were talking about earlier uh, 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 kind of fits. But it doesn't, I guess, you, if you hear what I'm saying, mm -hmm. it's not about, uh, you, can't, you can't just use the vocabulary of capital labor or capitalism um, to, to, to unpack it. Although that's a big, that's certainly a big part of it. No, I, I, would, I would agree. It, it, it does seem to me that um, in some ways the logic uh, in its narrow sense of the, of the marketplace runs contrary to the sorts of things that you're um, advocating. It to, uh, well, it does, but, you know... If, I'm, not, I'm not advocating but, but, I, but, but, you know, I think, uh, I guess another uh, aspect of feminist thinking, or at least my feminist thinking, mm -hmm. I don't want to speak for all feminist economists, is that, that, that the traditional left analysis really often is very, tends to romanticize pre-capitalist relationships. Mm -hmm. So you look at, you know, that Karl Polanyi is a good example of this, that for all of Polanyi's wonderful analysis of, of embeddedness and the importance of social institutions, his view of pre-capitalist or non-capitalist societies is a very idealized one. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look back in time, I see patriarchal institutions that were very coercive, yes, it was non-market, yes, it was communal, yes, there was a lot of solidarity, but there was a tremendous amount of very direct exploitation of women and, and children. And if capitalism had any positive effects on the social relations of the world we inhabit, it mm -hmm. was in loosening the grip of those patriarchal ties. So again, this is what, I think there's this wonderful and complex interaction between patriarchal institutions, which are very coercive, you know, women must care. Women have no choice but to take on caring responsibilities. This is what women do. We will punish women that don't take on those care responsibilities. That's one side. The other is sort of capitalism. Care is unimportant. If you want to provide it, provide it. But it's really up to you. It's just a matter of individual choice. You don't really have any obligation. You don't have, you don't have any social responsibility. That's the opposite extreme. Neither of those is a very good way of organizing a care economy, right? Uh, and that's, that's what's interesting is that we see these two polar opposites of, of obligation, but very gendered and exploitative obligation on the one hand, and like zero obligation, everybody should just do whatever they want 
And so somehow you've got you, you've got to establish the uh, the sense of uh, rece reciprocity, commu uh, uh, this this communitarianism that is perhaps lacking in, in a pure right uh, and obligation more. obligation to care for people who can't care for themselves and obligation to think about how you should share the burden of caring for those well, who do mitigating not care for the themselves. coercive aspect yes. of it as much as possible. Yeah. That's I guess the challenge yeah. going forward. Yeah. So I think it. I guess you know. I think it has some very interesting philosophical and ethical dimensions as well as as economic kind of measurement and policy issues. Yeah. I could go on for a long yeah. time, but uh, we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Fulbright, thank yeah. you very much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. It was a really real thank pleasure. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.